are more coming from the performance side, and now we have a developer coming into performance. So that's it's super interesting, I think. <laughs> and she will talk about fonts. Yes. And it's super important. So go away. <laughs> Carry away. <laughs> Sorry. I think you want me to go away. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can leave. No, if go you ahead, Abby. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Hello everyone, how are you doing? Are you excited to be here? I'm excited to talk to you about fonts. My name is Sia Karamalegos. It's a very uh, long Greek name. Actually, that's not even all of my name. But um, I am a web developer and performance engineer. I like front end. I end up still having to do full stack, sadly. But um, it's all right. I live in New Orleans. This is me at Mardi Gras. So. But that's enough about me. You're not here for me. I'm also a um, Google developer expert in web technologies. And I come more from the industry side. So I, um, I teach at conferences. I teach workshops on performance. But I also actually build um, web applications. And web really is my bread and butter. These are the slides um, at bit.ly font-perf, lowercase. You can find these slides so you don't have to scramble to copy anything down or um, take screenshots. They are deployed in the web, so all of these links are clickable. Um, yeah, you ready to get started? So I want to poll the audience really quick. Um, how many of you are super passionate about web performance and you're like a wonk? You're like really into like this, the weeds and the tech. There, there's a lot of you here. Um, how many of you are, um, you think performance is great and you love it, um, but you're, you know, a developer and you're still learning and you're in that process? Yay, there's lots of you. <laughs> and um, how many of you are curious but not yet convinced that performance is important? Okay. <laughs> and then the rest of you, why are you here? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. Um, but it's good to know. I like to know my audience because I'm going to adjust this a little bit. Um, I don't think we need this section because I think most of you care about performance. So we're just going to jump right in. But what about typography? Because I'm talking about fonts here. So I'm just going to take a super quick side thing and talk about typography. So typography is what language looks like. It communicates. Content is king, like the words are king. But typography still makes a difference. And if you don't understand that, let's look at these few slides. So think to yourself, what does this evoke in you? I'm going to go back and forth. It's, it's just one word, hello. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> Versus this. What are these, the, do these things evoke different feelings in you? Maybe this one's like, it's more out there, it's friendlier, it's open, it's trustworthy as a slab font. The next one is maybe a little quieter. But it's also all caps, so it's a little confusing. Is it yelling at me, but it's italicized? So. Um, I know most of you are not Americans, um, but these fonts, this is all the same word, right? New York, New York, New York. <laughs> I feel like I should have started singing the song. But, um, but each of these evokes a different feeling in me because I'm also, it's like brand recognition, so it's like associated with the publications that they are from or the sports teams they are used for. So typography is still important. But what, like when we talk about fonts in action, in the web, and typography, what annoys you? I like to be interactive, so I want you to shout things at me. What is something that annoys you about fonts and performance in the web? They are slow. They are slow when they're slow, right? What else? Special characters, Special characters yes. Yeah, yeah, there's like different loading issues. <laughs> yeah. Swapping fonts. Swapping fonts. And like, what else about swapping fonts? There's something that really annoys me. Flash. What? The flash. Oh, the flash. But also like, especially when it like moves everything and you're like, oh my God, I was halfway down this article and I have no idea where I am anymore, right? Like that's annoying. So I'm a web developer, but I'm also very concerned about user experience, which is why I love performance, um, because I want the users to be happy when they visit a page and not feel like it's annoying. So let's jump right into case studies. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about web fonts, so like Google fonts. How many of you use Google fonts or something similar? Yeah, we all love them. Yay. Um, so web fonts. 
Um, they're hosted on fast and reliable CDNs. They also have optimized variants. I don't know if you know this, but for example, with Google Fonts, I think Open Sans has at least 30 something different variants that optimize based on um, a user's browser. So, because uh, I don't know if you know this either, but <laughs> this is the joy of web development, browser differences, right? So like Safari is not going to render fonts in the same way that Chrome does. So this can be a little annoying. So it's nice when you use these CDNs because they can, you know, they can actually serve a more optimized font for that user's browser. This, sh <laughs> this should be an air quote. <laughs> Opportunity for shared caching. We'll get back to that in a little bit. <laughs> but we now have control over um, foot and foit, a uh, flash of unstyled text and flash of invisible text, and we'll talk about that a little later. What are the downsides? There's a minimum of two separate requests. I'll talk about why. We're going to jump right into that. You can't use resource hints. If you don't know what those are, it's all right. I'll tell you what they are. And it can't take advantage of H2 multiplexing <laughs> if the server can even prioritize it right. And luckily, right after my talk, Robin's going to dive deep into a lot of um, uh, H2 issues and other things. So I know the font's a little small on this. Our screen's a little small. But um, this is a network profile. I'm assuming most of you have seen a network profile. I mean, if not, you know, it's OK. We'll learn here. Um, so what's in this first line? What's the first line always, anyways? What, what file is that? It's like the page, right? Um, the second file, uh, you can't read it. I'll just read it to you. It says style.css, right? So what do you think that is? Style, style sheet, yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a trick question, not. Um, the, the third line, it says fonts.googleapis.com-css. What is that? It's, it's that call, it's, that, it's what you copy paste from Google Fonts into either the head or into your style sheet, right? But what kind of file is that? It's a CSS file, right? It's not the actual font. The CSS file does, have you ever opened it and looked at it? It does all the font face declarations. And then after that, it calls out to fetch the fonts. Um, so what do you think those last two lines are? The fonts. Does this look efficient to you? What's going on here? Why? What, does anyone notice like a big glaring issue of um, what's going on here and why I might have made this slower than it needs to be? So we have, remember, the index, the CSS, my font CSS, and then the fonts. That's the order. So what's going on there? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, sorry, sorry, camera. What's, why is this starting here after the CSS? Because I called it from my CSS. Have you ever actually, I'm going to break all these rules about the video, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I am calling the font from your style sheet because you know it gives you those two options. Um, sometimes it's easier to do this. Like maybe you're working with a framework or a tool and it's easier to drop your font call in your CSS, but you're paying a performance price. So what's one way we can fix that? What's one way that we can make it start loading right away? Put it in the head of the HTML. Um, so when we put it in the head of the HTML, this is what happens. So we've, we scooched it over some. We don't have to wait for the, C, the CSS to be downloaded and the CSM, CSS SOM created and um, then call our, finally, our CSS for our fonts. We can put it in the head, and it will start downloading that font CSS style sheet right away. But, what, but there's more things we can do here to make this faster, right? What do you notice about... You can't read this, but it says fonts.googleapis.com. And then the actual font lines say fonts.gstatic. You can't see the rest of this, but it's .com, and then there's a long hash for the font. So what's happening here? DNS. Yeah. But didn't we just make a call to, to Google? 
they're on two different domains. So the style sheet and the fonts are on two different domains. So what do we have to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about the font hints. But um, so the browser has to start up a connection to that separate domain. But it won't do that until it knows that it has to reach out to that domain. Um, so we have this wasted time, again, from doing this connection. We know we're going to do this connection, but we don't know until after that style sheet is um, downloaded and the CSS SOM is created so that it knows. So resource hints are our friends. Um, we're going to focus on these middle three. Um, this is a nice little handy thing I got from um, one of Abby Osmani's tweets. He's a... He was a performance engineer at Google. I think he's on a different team now. But he has some great stuff. Um, so pre-connect, preload, and prefetch are really fun um, resource hints. Uh, we'll talk about DNS prefetch also, but first I'll talk about the others. So what pre-connect does is it can warm up a connection for you. It can do all the steps of warming up that connection for you and just have it waiting for you in the background. But there's a time limit on it. Um, so if you don't think that you're going to access a domain until later, what you can do is instead do DNS prefetch, and it just does the DNS part. So at least it negotiates that time, but a pre-connect will do the rest of the connection as well. Um, but it has, it's time sensitive. Um, preload, what preload does is um, it tells the browser, oh, hey, I know I'm going to need this file soon. Download it now. So normally, browsers are smart. They're not going to download a file until they know it's necessary when we're talking about fonts and similar. So it's not going to pull it down until it knows that you have the matching characters and that you're using the font on that page based on the CSS. But preload says, hey, I'm going to just go ahead and download it now um, because I know I'm going to need it later, even though you don't know it yet. Prefetch lets you uh, put things in your cache for future use. We're not going to talk about that in here, but just so you know. So what can we do? Actually, conveniently, on this slide, that code snippet is exactly what you would use with Google Fonts. So what it says that is, I want you to warm up the connection to fonts.gstatic.com now. And so if we just put that in on the head of our HTML with our call to our style sheet, then that connection will start to warm up. And you can see it down here. You know, It's kind of just like on its own, hanging out here before the actual um, fonts are downloaded. So you just copy that line directly in there, and that does a pre-connect. And so now we've made our site faster by just doing these little kind of tricks. Like the code isn't significantly different, but you can actually make a pretty good chunk of um, savings just right there. Let's talk about self-hosted fonts. So these are fonts that you host you know, on your domain. So you might call them in your head like this, um, preferably in your head, because then you, know, you don't have the same problem as before when we call it from our CSS. So this is my waterfall. What's on the first line? The page itself, right? The second line is my style.css. That's also where I have my font face declarations. And then what's going on with those last two lines? It's the fonts, right? But like, what was one of those hints? Do you remember what I said earlier? There's a hint that can say, oh, hey. Hey, browser. Pre-connect uh, pre is for the connection. We've already, this is our domain, so we don't need to do any extra connection. Preload. So what we, oh, sorry, I forgot the mic was there. <laughs> um, so what we can do is we can say, hey, browser, I'm definitely going to use this font. I want you to download it earlier so I don't have this longer time of waiting. Because, um, you know, what else is happening? What happens while that font is downloading but it's not yet loaded? What does the page look like? It depends on your font display settings, but it, it's either going to be <laughs> invisible or it's going to be a different font <laughs> until that loads. Yeah. I call it foot. Yeah, fout. But other people say fout. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're not talking about uh, content. Um, so what we can do is we can preload. And the only thing I've added to these lines here is this rel equals preload. 
And then what can happen now on supported browsers is that um, those files will be downloaded right away. Any file I put link rel preload on there. So with great power comes what? Great responsibility, if you watched any superhero movie. Um, and so we don't want to abuse this, right? We only want to do this when we're actually going to use, they're definitely going to use the file on that page. Because we don't want to abuse <laughs> our uh, users' data plans. And also, I suspect, is it the next slide? I suspect that's why this has happened. I don't know. Does anyone know anyone on the Firefox team? So on Firefox, preload used to be supported, and now it's not supported. <laughs> it's like behind a flag. So um, I would really be curious if anyone on the Firefox team, please, uh, oh, my Twitter handle is the Green Greek. Um, <laughs> please let me know what happened there. Um, my guess is because maybe they are concerned about the users and kind of people abusing these privileges. So um, make sure that you don't abuse this privilege, but it will work in all the other modern browsers. So um, <laughs> remember when I said when I said uh, shared caching of popular fonts? I used to say like you know if you're using Open Sans or Roboto, don't uh, uh, just do it directly from Google Fonts. Oh, don't ever try to just copy the hash of the um, of the font itself. There's a hash, so don't try to copy that whole URL because those are changed often and they'll just disappear. So you never want to do that. Um, but shared cache is going away. So now you can contemplate whether it might be a good idea to download the font and serve it locally, even if it is a Google font. You'll lose some of the other benefits, like the variants and stuff like that. But um, because of double key caching, and I don't know if anyone's going to talk about this later, but shared cache is not really a benefit anymore. Let's talk about font rendering. So remember when I said <laughs> foit and foot? or fout. Um, Foyt is on this page. Oh, I know it's a little hard to see. Um, this is, I have a screenshot of performance happening. That's what's over here on the right hand side. And this is the page itself. If you look at the page itself, you can see there are actual words in my nav bar. But if you could see this screenshot better, <laughs> the projector is a little bit dark. Um, there's no words in my nav bar. There's no words in my button. Um, it's annoying, right? That's a flash of invisible text. Does anyone know why that's happening? This, is, this was using Google Fonts. Does anyone know why that was happening? Yeah, yeah. So the default for Google Fonts on their font display property was display swap. So that means that it's going to show the fallback font for up to three seconds, and then it finally will switch to the web font. Um, so it won't, I'm sorry, it will block it. <laughs> it won't show anything at all and, um, for three seconds, and then it will show the fallback, and then it will show the web font. Uh, and so this was annoying, right? Like you couldn't, you had no control over this before, but now you have control. Um, with the uh, Google Fonts API, and now by default, it has this part of the URL in it, if you just add and display equals swap, you will get um, display swap. And what display swap does is instead of um, making it invisible, it will show the fallback font until the font, web font is loaded. And we're going to kind of see a little bit of this in action in a minute. So that's really cool. If you have legacy apps that use Google Fonts, you can, make, you can make them use display swap if you want. All you have to do is add that last part of the URL. You don't have to like go in and like recopy your URLs. You just add the, um, the query at the end. So, let's not play. So, flash of unstyled text, right? That's this change here. That's annoying, right? Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's more annoying than others. Uh, if we think about what's happening here, I mean, this might vary by user. I feel like we used to match fonts based more on style. But if I'm, for example, reading a blog post or an article, the thing that's going to annoy me more is layout shift. So once that font comes in, if I'm on a totally different paragraph when it comes in, for me as a user, that's going to annoy me. So for me, 
I reckon, I, um, I guess, recognize the intent of this quote. The style doesn't matter so much as it has to flow the same way. And so there's some great tools that we can use, like um, Font Style Matcher. Uh, and I'm going to actually go to this. Um, and so what you can do is, you, let me zoom in so you can see this a little bit better. Um, you can put, it automatically has Google Fonts available here, but you can also upload your own font. And so I've uploaded this font, and I'm going to tell you more about that font. And what my fallback font used to be was Arial. So if I go down here, you can see them overlapped. Um, we can use a different color for each font. So Arial is red now. And then you can see in action like the shift that happens. Um, so I have this. This is actually a variable font. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So we can see what happens. And what we can do is we can adjust properties. For example, like font size, Arial. If you look here, it just it's a little bit smaller. So I could like bump up the font size. And I could basically provide an entire fallback font and um, change things, um, change which one is used based use on JavaScript. I prefer not to do JavaScript. So what I did is I put in some other web safe fonts in here. And I found that um, Verdana, I actually don't know how to pronounce that. Verdana, Verdana, <laughs> does anyone know? <laughs> I put that one in, and it matched a lot faster. But you can actually get super close on some fonts, and then maybe you realize you don't actually need <laughs> your web font. But, um, but at least here, my, um, the size of the font, the line height, and the, wet, the letter spacing really closely matches. So it makes a really great fallback font for me, because I don't want the extra JavaScript on the page just to load a separate um, font style as well. So that's a great tool to keep in your back pocket for um, having to deal with the uh, swapping fonts. How many of you have used variable fonts before? I figured I would go into this a little bit because they're, they're fun and new, and, so, um, and they also present some challenges for performance. So we are going to, we don't have slides for this, we're just going to do this. I started playing with this variable font called Recursive. They have a really cool website. Ooh. Um, and it's a highly flexible new variable font. What I should do is go to Firefox. When was the last time you used Firefox DevTools? Today. Yesterday. Oh, yay. Some of you actually used me. So um, I do use, <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, I do use Chrome mostly for performance. But um, Firefox has, <laughs> you know what helps with to do before your talk? <laughs> Get on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Actually, I think I might be. Hold on. Uh, yay. All right. Um, so if I go into the inspect my element. Actually, did I inspect that one? I was just doing it randomly. Let me inspect. What's really cool about Firefox DevTools is they have this whole fonts panel over here. I wonder if I can zoom in that. So if you look here, we're going to play this. Is, so you can see what this particular vari var variable font will do. I mean, you can play with standard things like size and uh, line height, which is kind of cool, and letter spacing. Oh, that's terrible. But it also has all these special things that are just for this particular variable font. And so what does this variable font do? Right now, it's on um, not monospace. But this font actually can be monospace as well. So I like to use my blog as my playground. And so I'm using this variable font so I can use, oh, this is my coding font too. And then, you know, and my body text is going to be that. And then um, I, it's called casual, but I call it sassy versus not sassy. Right now, that, I think that's sassy. Here's not sassy. And then here's sassy, AKA casual. Um, weight. So look at that. It's like a smooth transition. I can like choose any weight in there. That's pretty cool. So instead of like downloading, you know, you have to download your 700 weight, your 800 weight, like if you want heavy bold or your lightweight, um, you could theoretically just have all your weights in one variable font. And then slant, like italics. There's actually slant and italic are two different things. Um, italic actually changes um, slant features as well. So Firefox, that's one lesson from this. <laughs> Firefox infecting, inspecting fonts are really great. Actually, um, CSS Grid and other um, inspect element things are really cool there. Um, so that's a variable font, an intro to a variable font. Um, 
But um, how, how, many, how many kilobytes do you think are loaded when you do like a regular font? Has anyone like looked at that? How many kilobytes you use? Yeah, so I feel like, um, you know, like per, per style that you use. Because it might be like it's like 400 weight regular would be maybe 15 to 20 kilobytes or up to 30. It depends on really the font or in uh, what subsets you're using. Like is this just, you know, Latin text or is it others? Um, and so, <laughs> so maybe you have like, <laughs> maybe let's say you have four of those because you're doing, maybe you have two different fonts and you have two different weights. That's conservative. That's like 80 kilobytes maybe. So, <laughs> my basic English subset was um, 130 kilobytes, because <laughs> it's a variable font. Like I said, this is my blog, so I get to play with things. It's okay if they're a little bit bigger. So, what happened was a designer came out with a new version. The font designer came out with a new version, and he wanted me to deploy it, but it was like 400 kilobytes. And I was like, mm, I am a performance engineer. I don't think I should do that. <laughs> so, we started playing with performance more. So if we have things like variable fonts, what are some other things we could do, perhaps? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we have this all correct, but what do you think we can do? There's another thing I haven't spoken about here with fonts that you can do. Yeah. Yeah, so subsetting. We, well, we can subset based on character codes. Um, do you know about this inside your font? I don't know if you've played in font display properties. <laughs> We're all developers. I, most of us are developers in here, right? So it's like we don't often play or learn all the CSS things that maybe we should. <laughs> um, but uh, let me zoom in a little. I was going to show you the difference with um, Verdano, but it's fine. So what we did is we made more subsets. And so most of my uh, website is in basic English characters. And so um, you can put a Unicode range in your um, font face declarations. And it knows to use this font for this Unicode range. And this is the only one that I preload now. I don't preload the rest. And then the others will only ever load if they're used on a page. So um, like I have um, so, yeah, so, like some diacritics and some other things, some symbols and extended fonts, and then a special font just for my first name because I made it the super heavyweight. <laughs> so um, that's that's the path we chose. There's also tools you can do to subset your fonts if you want really aggressive subsetting. Um, it's actually called subfont. Uh, I think I have a link to it in the back of this. But if you want to look at subfonting, not just for variable fonts, for any fonts, you can look at this tool called subfont. Um, I forgot the developer who wrote it. But it kind of gives you a whole um, set of tools for um, setting up your fonts in a more performant way. So yeah. What's really cool about preload, which I forgot to mention because I wanted to show it to you live, um, is that often what happens is we can beat the rendering path. Remember what preload does? It, auto, it automatically, we put in our head that we're going to use this font and I want you to preload it. I want you to load it now. So what we can often do is, the only, th what happened there when I reloaded? Did you see that? I should slow it down. There's only one thing that happened there that you could visually see, right? Oh, now it's slower, because, so it did that. <laughs> but on a faster connection, what can often happen is we actually skip that fallback time. I do have a display swap on my name because it's brand, it's branded. So like branded things, you might want to keep swap because you don't want to see the, the ugly font on your brand. Um, but yeah. Um, so if I go to Firefox, right, which doesn't do... Preload. <laughs> Need to disable the cache. <laughs> this one has a much bigger layout shift. All right. So 
So more, re more resources mentioned. I do have a short article. It's a little bit dated now, but it still works. If you want to learn how to self-host your Google fonts, there's a little tool you can use in there and the steps involved. Um, also, when you're looking at things like, um, I didn't mention this in this talk specifically, but you can pull your data into Can I Use. Like if you use Google Analytics, you can pull in that data and you can see like, you know, for my particular users, is this feature going to be supported? Like for example, preload. Um, most of my users for one um, client are on um, Safari, so it's supported. Thank goodness. Um, and then subfont, that tool I mentioned, which you can use for any type of font. So thanks, thanks for coming to my talk. Again, the slides are at bit.ly, fontperf, and um, writing, resources, more, sia.codes. You can get, find me at the Green Greek. We will, um, yeah, I guess we'll take a few questions. I prefer offline questions, though. So feel free to come up to me later. I'll be in this room for the rest of the webperf thing, so in the breaks, and then also afterwards, if you want to you know, reach out to me, go out there. You can also DM me on Twitter. Um, and, or just mess or at me. It's up to you. But thanks for thanks for coming to my talk. Thank you, Sia.